With that, let me go into our text today from John chapter first John chapter two verse one to six. And the title is Live Living Like Jesus Lived. Live like Jesus lived. What did I write there? <laughs> Fly. Fly? That will be terrible. <laughs> oh. I forgive. <laughs> All right, don't worry about that. that. That's not her fault. That's the computer's fault. Yeah. Living like Jesus lived. The title itself is very daunting and very intimidating. Can we truly live like Jesus? It's not an easy task to take on the life of Jesus. So what John is trying to say, I would like to draw your attention to why he said living like Jesus. In the introduction, he introduced Jesus as a word of life. And we saw how we ought to live by the word of life that helps us to create fellowship and increase our joy. Then the second part in chapter 1 was living in the light of life. That means He is the life, He is the light and therefore we need to live in the light. And when we live in the light, then we are free from hypocrisy, we are free from this uh, pretension and uh, if we commit sin, if we have made mistakes, we do not have to pretend to be holy. We can confidently confess before God and before men and say, I'm sorry, I'm not as good as you thought I was. I am a sinner, but saved by the grace of God. And that's why he said, we need to live in the light of life. We do not live in darkness. Living in the darkness was to live a lie. Just like as the title here, living lie. Living in the darkness would be to pretend that I am so perfect, so holy, but inside I am so rotten and completely uh, stinking. And he said that living in the darkness was actually living not in love but in hate. Living in the darkness would be hating someone and still pretending that we love each other. So he said first, live by the word of life and then secondly live in the light of the life and today he is asking us to live like Jesus lived. And I said to you this title itself is very intimidating, uh, very fearful, very scary. There is no way we could ever live like Jesus because he is the only perfect man who lived a sinless life and there is no way we can ever think or imagine of living the way he lived. Nevertheless, because he was a sinless man, because he lived a sinless and perfect life, he gives us this opportunity. He offers us the opportunity, the privilege of living his life in us by inviting him into our life, by asking him to come in us and live. Only he can live such a life. You cannot live, I cannot live. If you want to live like Jesus, you have to invite him into your life. He must be the one who is living in your life. That's what Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself as a ransom for me. I don't live anymore. It's no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. And if Christ is the one who lives in me, then I have hope. Because it's not me who's living, he is the one who lives, but I get the credit. People look at me and they think, oh, he is a good person. But in reality, it is not me who is a good person, it is the Christ who lives in me. I am a sinful human being, but hidden in Christ. When Augustine, a vile man, rich and wealthy, famous orator, professor, lived a terrible sinful life but never got any fulfillment out of it was just walking by somewhere in Rome here's the children's song saying go and pick up and read pick up the scroll and read pick up the scroll and read believing that was the voice of God he goes and opens the scroll he happens to have a Romans Paul's letter to Rome 
and opens the book of Romans and reads chapter 13, verse 14, where he says, Do not live by sinful, or don't live to gratify the passions of your sinful man, but put on Christ. Put on Christ. So that you will not have to live to gratify the desires of your sinful nature. From that day onward, Augustine began to put on Christ. Though not, he doesn't claim to be a perfect man, but he left uh, a, uh, an influence in history of Christianity that is still so tall, so towering, that he decided to live, not by himself, but by putting on Christ. And so therefore, living like Christ uh, is not going to be possible if we do not allow Christ to come in our life on a daily basis. We're going to fail to live like Christ. Let me first read before we uh, discuss this chapter. First John chapter 2 verse 1 to 6. Let me read for you. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. It's a purpose of writing. It's a clear statement of purpose. He said, the reason I'm writing this letter to you is that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone, does, if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus lived. Whoever claims to live in him must live as he lived, as Jesus lived. We have seen from two weeks how John by this time is an old man. But I think not only is he writing like an old man saying, My dear children, In chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, he has said very clearly that there is no one who can claim sinlessness. All of us are sinful. But when we confess our sins, Jesus is just and faithful to forgive us from all our sins and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. And then he comes to chapter 2 and says, My dear children, the reason I am writing this to you is that so that you will not sin. This affectionate address to his believers, my dear children, may have come from a heart that is so sympathetic towards the struggle of Christians that they struggle to live a holy life. They struggle to live a sin-free life. They struggle to live to please God, but they fail. And John, as a beloved disciple of Jesus Christ, and a loving pastor, an elder, an apostle, he says, my dear children, I know you're struggling with sin. I know you don't want to live the kind of life you find yourself in. Therefore, this is why I am writing this to you, that you will not sin. Because your sin is going to cost you dearly. When you live in sin, when you live in a habitual sin, either you haven't known Jesus as your personal Savior, or His atonement, His sacrifice, His forgiveness has not been made clear to you. So, my dear children, I don't want you to live in sin. My English sermons, I don't know whether I can communicate to you the biblical truth or not. My language is not this one.
But there are some messages that I do post online, those are Nepalese. The, the, I preach them either from my living room or when I go back to Nepal, I preach and I post them online. And about thousands of them uh, watch those sermons. Nepalese are scattered all over the world this time. And many of them have written to me with heartfelt pain and sorrow. They say, Pastor, I do not want to live this kind of life. Because they don't know me personally, they only see me online and they can be honest and open up. If it is face to face, I don't think they would open up to me this kind of a graphic expression of their sinful lifestyle. Even you, if you, if you go to a pastor, uh, even if you really, really trust that person, maybe you'll open up. Otherwise, you find it difficult to open up to a person and say, I'm struggling with this in my life. But if it is indirect, uh, then you may be, I'm sure, be able to express your struggle. So I received many, many messages throughout the week asking me, what should I do? How should I overcome? How should I? I don't want to live this kind of life. And when I read those emails and messages, it breaks my heart. I can see the longing to live for God in them. I can see the longing to live a holy life. I can see the longing to please God. But they struggle. I think John is writing from that kind of a heart that sees the, the destruction sin brings in a person's life. The sin that steals their joy, their happiness, their peace, their prosperity their health and their sanity. And he said, My dear children, I do not want you to live in sin because you've been struggling too much. You're missing so much in life by allowing sometimes the sin to dominate your life. Therefore, I am writing this. The purpose of my writing is that you do not let sin dominate your life. Because sin will, one way or the other, kill It'll kill you physically, it'll kill you socially, it'll kill your joy, it'll kill your peace, it'll kill your happiness, it'll kill your money, it'll kill your future. If you are engaging in some kind of a habitual sinful behavior, it will destroy you. And sadly and unfortunately, Sometimes we have this false assumption or false sense of security that since nobody knows me, I'm okay. But that's not true. You know, God knows, the devil knows, and one day someone else is going to know. Sin will be exposed in one way or the other. It, it will give birth to something and that you cannot hide. So that is why he say, I do not want you to live in sin. I am writing this so that you will not sin. But then he moves on to a next level. My purpose is for you not to sin. My desire for you to aim this sinless perfection. I want you to be sinless. That is what you should do. Uh, a commentator has said, in this world, we cannot be sinless, but we can sin less. Does it make sense? In this world, we cannot be sinless, but we can sin less. We must see some kind of progress in our sanctification. If the kind of sinful lifestyle I had last year, it should not increase in me, that should decrease. I should be able to say, I am not what I used to be. I am not yet what I want to be. I was a terrible man, but I am better. But I am still far from perfection. But that's my goal, that's my aim. Jesus Christ is my aim. He is my ambition. He is the target that I wish to reach. Therefore, I am moving towards that. So John is asking us, have this sinless perfection as your aim. Have Christ as your aim. Aim to be like Him. Live like Him. But, he said, 
in verse 2. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, who Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Sinlessness is our aim, and sinning less is our daily activity, it's our practice. And on the process of sinning less, there are times we make mistakes in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. And when that happens, then he said, don't beat up yourself to death. Do not allow sin to defeat you forever. Just because you fail one time does not mean you have been completely out of the plan of God. No, sin has no power actually. Sin has no power over you. When you confess, He is able to forgive you. Every time you confess your sins to Christ, He is able to forgive you. In fact, the price of your sin has been paid once and for all. He paid for your past sin, present sin, and the sins you will commit until you die. But nevertheless, those sins that we commit along the way have consequences the price to pay and they still have the power to kill us in one way or the other maybe our salvation is so secure when you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior your uh, occasional sinfulness will not destroy your salvation that's for sure because you're not saved by your righteousness therefore your, your salvation cannot even be destroyed by your sinfulness but if you're living habitually in sinful lifestyle without confession, that then means your salvation itself is in question whether you are born again or not. So a born again believer deep in the heart will long to please Christ, will long to live a sinless life even though he or she cannot live. So in that case he says we have an advocate who stands before the Father on a daily basis according to John Calvin's uh, interpretation Jesus stands before the Father and continuously offers His atoning sacrifice for us on a daily basis. So our salvation from a Christist perspective is a present tense. It's not once and done for all. It's a present tense daily activity that every time we walk in this world, we, we wake up and we live in this life, we are sinful human beings, we are going to make mistakes in life, and then Christ is ever present. Just like you are living here as present reality, so is Christ a present reality before the Father offering atonement for you and I. It's as if it's a perpetual atonement until perfection comes. So he is our advocate. This word advocate is also called comforter. When it comes to Holy Spirit, the same word is used in the context of comfort. The Holy Spirit is called advocate in this world who comforts us. Sometimes he convicts us. He comes along and says, this is wrong, this is right. Then Jesus, on the other hand, is an advocate as if he is an attorney. He's a defense lawyer standing before the Father and the devil is there to accuse you and your conscience is there to accuse you. When your conscience accuses you, when the devil accuses you, then Jesus says, guilty, but I have paid it in full. Therefore, my father, my brother, and my sister is innocent because I have paid the penalty. I have become him, I have become her. Therefore, now she has become me, he has become me. And just as I am innocent before you, father, therefore your child is innocent. That's the comforter. That's the different lawyer. So you and I are not going to go to heaven because you are so good and moral and beautiful people. We are going to go to heaven because this advocate, this comforter, stands on our behalf. He says, He is me, I am him. 
and therefore I have paid the penalty of sin completely, this person is free from the wrath of God. So he is our advocate, he is our propitiation, he is our atoning sacrifice and on the basis of that atoning sacrifice we can still get away with our occasional sinfulness. Does that mean we have license to sin? If we use that, oh, Jesus paid for my sin so I can go and live in sin and enjoy my life, that means you have not been born again. When you use the grace of God as a license in sin, it, it brings into question the validity of your salvation experience. But if you are truly, truly born again by the power of God's word, if you are truly, truly a child of God, sealed by the Holy Spirit, you will occasionally make mistake. But you will not justify that. You will confess it. You will say, Lord, I am a sinful human being. Forgive me. So John says, therefore, don't allow sin beat you down too much. Don't be so terrified with your occasional failures. But trust Christ. Humble yourself and go to him. And say, Lord, I have failed you. Now, not only that, he said, Jesus is not only the atoning sacrifice for us, those who believe, he said, for those of the whole world. He is not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now that's a very difficult passage. Many people interpret in a many different way. And some of the people will come to an extent where they say, Jesus paid the sins of the whole world. Therefore, eventually the whole world will be saved. I don't think John was speaking in that kind of a context. John coming from a Jewish background, speaking to largely Jewish context, he is attacking what we call this, uh, this particularistic view that we are the chosen people of God. We are the covenant people of God. The Gentiles are condemned by God. Only the Jews are the special people who will inherit the kingdom of God. So speaking from that context, John says not only for the Jews, not only for those who are in the covenant, Jesus paid for the sins of the people of the world as well. Whoever believes in Christ, he paid for their sins. Whoever accepts Jesus as their personal Savior, Jesus paid for this whole world's sins as well. Not only for our sins, but for the sins of the world. It's kind of a attacking this, what we call the racial pride that Jews had. We are the special people. We are the chosen people. We are the heaven-bound people, and sometimes even Christians have that kind of a mentality. Christians think that people who are in the church are special, and people who are not in the church, outside the church, Buddhist or uh, Confucius or atheist, are not so important. That's a very sad way of thinking. In the sight of God, we all are precious. In the sight of God, there is no Christian or Buddhist or atheist or a Muslim. God loves the whole world. And therefore he made a provision that anyone, whosoever out of the world, would like to come and receive this salvation is freely available in Jesus Christ. So he says, Jesus is not only the atoning sacrifice for our sins, he is also the atoning sacrifice for anyone out there in the world. If Christians could live with that deep-seated human compassion for the non-believers, church would look like different. But somehow, inside of our heart, we have this self-righteousness, a pride that says, I am very special. God has chosen me. God loves me. I am so special. I am going into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, I must be better than a Hindu or Buddhist outside. I am special. I have more value than a Buddhist or Hindu. That is a self-defeating, non-Christian attitude. It's a humanistic, uh, self-centered way of thinking. So the reason John is telling Jesus is not only atoning sacrifice for your sins, he is also the atoning sacrifice for the whole world. You are not so special. God loves everyone. And therefore we ought to live a life that presents him to those who are lost. If we humble ourselves before God and say, Lord, I am no better person than a Hindu, a Muslim, a Buddhist, or anybody. 
but thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving my sin. Now let my life be such that when they see me, I want them to see you. If you could live like that, then the world also will come to know Jesus. I have said many times, the greatest obstacles to the gospel of Jesus Christ is not atheists, not Muslims, not Hindus, not Buddhists, the Christians. The greatest obstacles for the, the lost person in the street to know Christ is not him, but Christians who fail to live like Christ. So John said, anyone who claims to be in Christ, if anyone who claims to know Christ must live like Christ. How can you live like Christ? Next verse. From verse uh, 3 to 6, he gives us how we can live like Christ. First of all, he says, if you make mistake, occasional sinful behaviors creep into your life, you find yourself, don't kill yourself, don't beat up. You know, William Cower or Cooper, I forgot his name. William Cooper, right? I forgot. A man who wanted to kill himself because he thought God wouldn't forgive him. Three times he tried to commit suicide. One time he wanted to shoot himself and the, the gun jammed. Then he tried to jump into River Thame and he hired a wagon. He told this man to take him to a dangerous place so that he could jump into the river. But the man took him around and it was so thick, foggy London street, the man lost his street. So after rooming around and around and around, he came back to the place where he was staying again. And he was so mad. <clears throat> Finally, he went into his room. He hung himself. And the rope broke. <laughs> he fell unconscious. And friends came, found him out, then put him in mental asylum. And in the mental asylum, he read the Gospel of Matthew and gave his life to Christ and became a greatest hymn writer, one of the greatest hymn writers of the English world. And one of the most popular hymns that I like of him is, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. Sinners plunge beneath the flow and be cleansed once and for all. He, that's a powerful hymn. So, when you fail, John says, Don't kill yourself by William Cobra. Jesus is your advocate. He is your father. He is your brother. He is your everything. And the reason he came so that you don't have to die. Charles Kettering, Kettering, sorry. Charles Kettering is an American inventor. I think you must know. One of the famous inventors of the 19th century. In his name there are nearly 190 patents registered. and Especially in in electronic engineering, mechanical, even chemical engineering. The paints we have, I think, owes to him. And the torpedoes and all these missiles also owe to him. He said, when you fail, fail intelligently. When you fail, you should fail intelligently. That means, he said, first of all, be honest in your failing. He is an inventor. How many times he must have failed? And he said, when you fail, don't fake your success. Fail intelligently. Apply that to our spirituality. Don't pretend to be so spiritual when you are not. Admit, confess your sins. Secondly, he says, don't waste your failures. That means learn from your failure as much as you can. Analyze, ask questions. Why did you fail? What was the cause of your failure? Learn from your failures. Don't waste your failure. So even as a Christian, in your spiritual walk, when you fail, don't just let that failure remain. Study about it. Why did you do the things that you did? What is the reason behind it? Where is this coming from? make it your ambitions to learn from your failure. Then thirdly he said, do not make your failure as an excuse for not trying it again. 
When you make your failure as an excuse for trying it again, for example, oh, I cannot quit smoking, oh, I cannot quit telling a lie, oh, I cannot quit shoplifting or something like that. I've been doing it many times, so I think I should give up, I should continue to do it. So don't make failure as an excuse for not trying it again. So John would also say, when you fail, don't worry, come to Christ, confess your sin. And then you can live like Christ. How? Verse 3 to 6, let me read once more time for you. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Two things, he said. Keep his commands, obey his word. When you keep his commands, he's putting these very, very difficult to analyze John's writing actually. He's all over places. He uses many different words in very difficult context. So here he says, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his command. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. That means keeping commands is upholding the truth. You are accepting truth. You are, you, you are not allowing lies to come into your person. Then he says, verse 5, If anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. Obey his word, and then love of God is made perfected. Keep his command, you are in the truth. Obey his word, you are in the love. So you see, love and truth are these two wings by which you fly to live like Christ. If you have truth in you, that will lead you, lead you to Christ. Jesus said, if you know the truth, then truth will set you free. You do not have to be in bondage anymore. So, because you have the truth, then you know the word of God. When you obey the word of God, then you are filled with love. And in love, there is no fear, no more bondage. In truth, you have freedom. In love, you have freedom. When you are a free person, you are free to fly and live like Christ. That's, that's what he would say. Moreover, who claims to live in him must live as sin. Uh, he, sin in Jesus Christ himself. The way you see Jesus living, you live like him. So keep his command. What are his commands? He says, keep his command, keep his command. What are the commands? We all know those two things, right? Right? Look at how he will explain in chapter 3. John chap 1 John chapter 3, verse 19 to 23, he says like this. Very carefully, pay attention. This is how we know that we belong to the truth. You see, truth and love. Truth and love. And light is also coming in between. But in this place, truth and love. This is how we know that we belong to the truth. And how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. That means you cannot lie, you cannot live in lie. God sees what is in your heart and then your heart will condemn you, your conscience will condemn you. Number 21. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask because we keep His commands and do what pleases Him. Again, He says, when your heart is free, then God will answer your prayer. Why? Because you keep His commands and obey His word. Keep His command, obey His word. 23. And this is his command. Number one, to believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and to love one another as he commanded us. Two things. To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we say love God and love fellow human being. In John's language, it is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, when you come to Christ, 
you are accepting Jesus as an atoning sacrifice for your sin. The reason you ought to believe in Jesus is that he is the only hope you have. You accept him as your savior. You accept him as your sacrifice for your sins. In fact, John would go on to say that if you don't accept Jesus coming in the flesh, dying as a man, then you're not a Christian. You're not a believer. Your salvation is in question. So first commandment Jesus gives is to believe in him as an atoning sacrifice for your sins. Only that will set your conscience free. Only that will set your heart free from condemnation. You cannot make your heart free by your own righteousness, own efforts. So he says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 6, Jesus talked about the bread of life. He said, I am the bread that came from heaven. And prior to that, he had fed 5,000 people. And next day, these people who had eaten from him plenty went back to the same place looking for him and they didn't find him. So he had gone to different town and they came looking for him. And when they finally found him, he said, Lord, we've been looking for you. Where have you been? Jesus looks at them and says, you did not look for me because of who I am or what I have said. You are looking for me because you had your stomach filled yesterday. You are looking for bread. And then he says, do not work for the bread that will perish, but work for the bread that will never perish. And then they asked him, then what kind of work is that? Tell us what kind of work is that which will give us a bread that will never perish. And Jesus said, the work that Father has commanded is to believe in the one whom he sent. So the work of God is to believe in Jesus Christ. And here the commandment of God is first to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. To accept him as your substitute, as your savior, your solution to your problems. To trust in him. Not in your own self or own morality or own good works. Secondly, to love one another as he commanded. So then when you, once you trust Christ, then second part of the commandment is to love one another. When you do this, then it will set your heart free from condemnation. When your heart is free from condemnation, you have access before the Father. And when you go before the Father, he will answer your prayers. Many people dare not to pray big prayers. They dare not believe God answer their prayers because they are trying to be good before they could pray a prayer like that. They think that if I pray, I don't think I'll answer, uh, get the answer because I'm not good enough. So they work hard to become good. They fast, they, they, they come to church, they read the Bible, they do all kinds of things hoping that they'll be better so that they can have enough faith to pray such prayers, <coughs> asking great things from God. But John is telling, no, that's not how you ought to pray. You first need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure that your salvation is secure. Then secondly, make sure you have love in your heart for fellow human beings. You're free after that. Your heart is free. That book of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 would tell you, come before the throne room of God's grace confidently so that you will receive help in time of your need. How can we live like Christ? Keep his commandments. How can you live like Christ? Obey his word. What are the commandment? To believe in him. To trust in him. Not to believe in you. Not to trust in your good work. Not to trust in your righteousness. But in his righteousness. Secondly, make sure that you love your fellow brothers and sisters. The moment there is bitterness against one another, the moment there is hate against one another, again, you disqualify yourself and you live in the dark, not in the light. You do not live in the power of the word of life. You do not live in the light of life also and therefore you cannot live like Christ. But on the other hand, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe in him, as your atoning sacrifice, your Savior, 
your hope, your forgiveness, your everything, your king, your lord. And then you love fellow human being. You are a powerful person. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Your sins cannot separate you from the love of God. Other sin cannot separate you from the love of God. Circumstances cannot separate you from the love of God. Difficulties and challenges and persecution, sickness, even death cannot separate you from the love of God because you obey His command and you are living in the light of life and you are living like Christ. Shall we close our eyes and ask ourselves the question, am I living like Christ? Can I live like Christ? What is the way to live like Christ? First of all, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't believe in yourself. Don't believe in your righteousness. Don't believe in your morality. Don't believe in your good works. Absolutely, completely you are saved only by the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. He is your salvation. He gave you this gift of life. He chose you in such a way that He accepted you as His child. Then, because He did this to you, you want others also to come into the kingdom of God. You want other human beings to come and experience the same salvation that you experienced. So your life is now characterized by love. Whatever you do, you are motivated by the love of God. You are not motivated by power or greed or self-centeredness. In fact, Paul says, if I do not have love and I do great and mighty things also, those will be useless. But it is the love of God that compels me to share the gospel. It is the love of God that motivates me to live a life in such a way that somehow I will win people to Christ. You become a humble and kind and compassionate person not because those things are receiving some kind of blessing for you but those things are becoming instrument in the hand of God for people to come and see Christ in you because you live like Christ. When you live like Christ, people will be attracted to Him. But if you are living not like Christ, people will be repelled from Him by looking at your life and my life. 